Hey, hi everyone. So, uh, my name's Asian Friend and I head up the Defence, National Security and Public Safety business at um, SUK. Um, I'm going to spend about 20 minutes going through some of the, the high-level overview of what it is ESRI does and how we link into Mark Logic. And then my trusty, glamorous assistant and fellow granddad, Mark Clues, uh, will be showing you how it actually works. Um, so, if you don't know ESRI, we're a, we're a global company. Um, we have thousands of customers all around the world and basically uh, we do pr um, produce the world's most powerful mapping and spatial analysis software. Um, the folks who run uh, the world use our stuff to, um, to make their decisions. So it's really a decision support tool and ArcGIS, ArcGIS is its term. Um, and we've, we've been in existence for about 50 years now, which may not sound a long time, but in the world of GIS, Geographic Information Systems, it is about as long as it's been going. So what is a, a, a geographic information system? Well, it's basically something that allows you to visualize, analyze, and share spatially referenced material and data. So you get your date, data in, it has a spatial stamp. So that's the coordinate system anywhere in the globe that then allows us to mix different data sets. And we have a whole range of apps, web-based apps, mobile apps, desktop apps, and server apps that then allow you to start to exploit this data in an open way, open architecture, open standards, and in a distributed manner. But it's so much more than geographic. So it's a geographic information system, but this was created 50 years ago, right? And that's where the, the, the term comes from. So actually, there's three Gs. There's three types of geo. There's the geographic, so that's we're able to represent, um, uh, visualize, and analyze both the human and the physical geography. So that allows us to do things such as understanding social demographics, where people live, analyze roads, do routing, understand um, line of sight type analysis, so anything with the physical world. But things move on. So Esri, it, it provides evergreen software and services. So every year we put in $250 million into R&D. So what GEO was and what the GIS was is not what it is. And what it is today is not what it's going to be tomorrow. So now it's geospatial, and we should start thinking geospatial, and this allows us to bring in real-time feeds, and that could be video feeds, it could be tracking people, it could be tracking equipment, it could be tra tracking anything. So anything that could be tracked and has the spatial stamp, you can get it into the system, and you can start analysing it. And it's also geotemporal, so as well as the spatial reference, we can start to exploit time. So a geographic information is so much more than just representing maps and representing the real world. Um, in, in the shape of a map. It's all about exploiting. It's exploiting the where and the when, time and space. So actually, it's a lot more complicated than the first slide that I showed. So now you can see that there's all types of different data that can be pulled into the GIS. We've got the traditional sort of GIS maps and geographic data. We've got imagery. So we can do imagery, we can do video, enterprise data, big data, and real-time internet of things or, or, or um, uh, tracking any type of asset you want. And for the enterprise data, I guess that that's where the, the Esri Mark logic relationship comes in. That, that we've been partners now for about five years, and we really work together. And the reason that, that we work together is if you look at this example, as a platform, we can start to pull in information from sensors in real time. This allows us to do the real-time decision analysis, allows us to do forensic analysis, and allows us to do predictive analysis. But if you're only ever exploiting the where and the when, the date timestamp and the location, you don't understand the true value of that information. It can just be dots on a map. So by integrating with Mark Logic, we can pull in all the semantic data, which means that you can really understand what it is you're looking at. And also, by working with folks such as Mark Logic, you can access the data. So the data might be in the right format, and it might be a big data store, and you can get it in, in the right format. But if it's stovepiped, there is no point in having the data in the right format if you don't have it so that you can do real-time decision-making. And that's, and that's why the relationship is important. So moving on from the, 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 the three Gs, what, it is, what is it we actually do? Because it's so much more than mapping. Well, what we do is we provide a system of technology to organisations that allow them to exploit the where and the when in their enterprise data in order to understand the why, and for sort of police and national security, the who and the how, to determine the so what next. So it's the four W. So it's so much more than just visualizing maps. So if I was to phone up one of our customers who's an insurance company, they'll have their own data holdings. They'll ask me, right, how old are you? I'm 45, I work like a dog, I drive, not, drive an old Honda. And they'll then take that real-time information and they'll exploit the where and the when 
they'll understand the why, which is, are they going to insure me or not? And then the so what next is, how much is it going to cost me? And that can all be done without a map, because it's actually a decision-making tool. And then we t then talk about the five patterns of GIS, and this is sort of really the high-level services or business needs that, that our customers use our system of technologies for. So it's geographic, it's geospatial, it's geotemporal, it exploits the where and the when, you understand the why, you determine the what next, but what is it you actually do with it? And we can put it into these like five high-level buckets. Planning analysis, operational awareness, field data collection, asset management and community engagement. And that really, everything that folks do falls into one of those buckets and it's just a way for us to sort of start to explain what it is we as a company can provide to you and what you can do with our stuff. And of course this is all then um, improved by the integration of the enterprise data so that you're not just exploiting where and when, you're understanding the semantics and that's the real trick. So if we look at some examples, so planning and analysis, this is about using the platform to understand some of the complex relationships between people, place and events by turning ordinary and sometimes hidden data into actual information that can help you make a timely decision. So here we have an example of Hampshire Fire and Rescue. So Hampshire Fire and Rescue have a cloud-based solution that allows them to undertake comprehensive risk analysis on the causes of fire. And that's then enabled them to take preventive action, which has reduced the number of fires by 50% that they have to respond to in recent years. And what they do is that they take the historic fire data and then they integrate that with a whole host of other data sources, such as healthcare, social demographic, which then allows them to understand what's the correlation on the causes of fire to identify high-risk areas or groups of individuals. This information can then be shared down to the station level using the platform so that the station commanders can then start to do um, uh, safe and well visits to target the specific causes of the fire. And that's how they use the risk in a cloud-based solution to reduce the number of fires. Operational awareness. So um, many organisations have multiple stakeholders who need uh, easy to understand, accurate and timely access to operational data in order to un undertake their duties effectively and make timely decisions. Roadworks, um, if not planned and coordinated properly, can be hugely disruptive in any city. And Transport for London have the unenviable task of trying to manage over 500,000 roadworks in the capital every single year. And London Works is their platform that, that um, is a, a live data feed of all the 1,300 street work activity that goes on in the capital daily. And that's everything from fixing potholes to cross rail that can then be analysed and shared in real time to all the multiple stakeholders so that they can coordinate activity and minimise disruption. Field data collection. So many organisations have mobile workforces and having the um, ability to get accurate and timely information both into and out of the field not only creates empowered in, and informed uh, workforces but it also streamlines workflows and reduces operating costs. So here, um, Thames Estuary Asset Management 2100 is um, a, a, a project that's run by Environment Agency in conjunction with CH2M Hill. And they're responsible for the UK's largest flood defence programme in the country. It includes 350 kilometres of defences as well as the Thames Barrier. Um, the team is responsible for regularly assessing the condition of the defences so that they can plan and coordinate maintenance activity. And they've reduced the time by half to do this by moving away from traditional paper-based approaches to using collector and drone for maps to capture, um, to quickly capture and safely videos, photos and other information of the whole um, estate that they can then upload and share with all the other parties so that they can collect it quicker, they can disseminate it quicker and it can be action quicker. Asset management, so whether it's people, it's infrastructure, it's equipment. Every single organisation has some form of asset that it needs to manage and understand. And the platform allows people to capture the information, analyse it, understand it and share it. An example here, um, Tarmac went, went through a, a fairly major reorganisation in 2013. And at this point, they actually lost um, the ability to accurately identify what their land holdings were. So a small team was pulled together and within a fairly short amount of time, they were to, able to accurately identify and plot all 65,000 hectares that they own. 
Um, it was then loaded into a central um, database that could be easily shared with everybody within Tarmac so that it increased understanding. But not only did they just show where the assets were and where the land holdings were, they um, attributed it, they showed things such as um, what's the population, what's the development potential, what would the haulage cost be if they undertook other um, uh, development on that land, and they really started to improve the understanding of the assets by linking it to other data sets that they held within the organisation. And lastly, the um, last um, sort of pattern is community engagement. So this is all about using the platform to help folks um, uh, work together and work collaboratively in order to share, analyse and understand information. So whether it's physical or virtual teams, the platform can bring these folks together to work collaboratively and turn them into empowered informed community of interest. And this is a really sort of cool example actually. So University of Exeter run one of these massive open online courses on climate change. It's a 7,500 students from 161 countries. And they use story maps to actually um, get the students to um, mark their position, where they're from, and a little um, bit about their experiences as to why they joined the course. So by getting the 7,500 students to write down how has climate change affected them and what are, their governments, uh, what are their governments doing about it, it made a virtual community, it really brought it together. Uh, because people could start to see what's the, what's the spread of everyone, what type of problems are they having. It made it personal and it really did show the global nature of climate change. And that's the type of thing from community engagement. So the five patterns of GIS, um, I've shown you one example for each one. But there are so many examples. And what we find is that folks are actually limited by their imagination rather than the technology these days. Uh, and that's the same in so many walk walks of life. But everything that I've shown you could have been improved and enhanced if you start to understand semantic linkages. You can get access to the data, you break down stove pipes and you increase your data holdings. And lastly, um, before I hand over to Mark who will be doing the more interesting stuff, it's just to say that um, it's not just software that we provide, it's a service. And that service can be everything from a local install of a bit of software onto a desktop or a, a laptop, all the way through to a fully managed cloud-based service. So we can have folks that can help you sort of start to update and, and, and uh, make sure that the technology is evergreen. Because it, if, if you're not up to date on the software, not just Esri, any software, you start to miss out on the functionality. For us, every year you're not updating, you're missing out on $250 million of R&D, and you will be doing what other people could do yesterday. Data, data as a service, so there's, there's, um, there's, there's already stuff, stuff in, that we provide in the cloud, and we can either provide stuff in the cloud or stuff behind the firewall. And our cloud-based solution, ArcGIS Online, already has about 50 billion hits per year, and it comes with the Living Atlas, which is a really rich data source. But for those who are behind the firewall, we can process that data and we can supplement it with other data sets that you need to, to take the hassle out of how to try and prepare data, which, which can, can, can be quite um, time consuming. And then the software as a service. So as I showed you, Hampshire, Hampshire Fire and Rescue, cloud-based solution. We work closely with um, Microsoft and Amazon. Uh, we'll put stuff in the cloud, which then means that you can start to do the planning analysis, the operational awareness the mobile working, asset management, and community engagement, all in the cloud. It really sort of starts to take some of the infrastructure issues away from you. Um, so I know that was a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but it was just basically to say that a GIS, geographic information system, don't think what it was 50 years ago. It's geographic, it's geospatial, and it's geotemporal. Anything with a date timestamp, you can start to exploit. You can then start to unlock the strategic, the strategic value of information and any person, any device, any classification can have the same look and feel and functionality. And that's what a GIS is. It is a decision-making tool. So now I'd like to hand over to Mark, who will walk you through some, some, some uh, um, uh, really good examples. Right, I'm actually going to show you some live stuff. Um, I don't want to take you through the sort of moving parts, but show you some live stuff. You just bear with me for sort of four or five slides, <coughs> just a little bit more to say. So this slide it comes from one of the videos that shows some of the market logic Esri integration. I mean, Adrian's actually sort of mentioned it already, so we should be getting there. But this, this is really where it is. Bottom left, there's your triples, there's your graph view of the world, these connections and linkages. 
And what we're really doing as a first step, and this is dots on map, this is tribute stuff, is top right. Get those dots on that map so we can understand. So we've got a morphological world and a measuring or a geospatial world. I'm not saying any one is more important than the other, but they need to be used together. It's as simple as that. And the first step is dots on maps. You know already it's, it, that, that, that's just a trivial piece. And I'll, I'll take you through some of that. So that's the first thing to get your head around, that that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. And um, I just need to break out very, very quickly and mention this. Um, Mark Logic has got something called OBI, Object Based Intelligence, as a technical piece. Activity based intelligence is something completely different. It's a concept and it's a way of operating. Uh, sorry, sorry, I've got to stand back here. Um, activity based intelligence, so it's a concept and it's a way of operating. So it's very different from that OBI you hear from uh, Mark Logic. Ben Conklin's name is up there, but some of these slides are his, so I want to give him credit for, for it. If you want to know more, type in ABI and Ben Conklin, you'll get the videos and the brief on it. But really, um, this is where we are on the right-hand side. So ABI is that stuff on the right-hand side. It's about integrating stuff. It's about lots of data. It's about unstructured data. All these things you are hearing about at this conference and how we deal with that. As geospatial people, we go, yeah, that's what we do anyway. Um, but this is a new way of doing things. There's some clever words on it. Um, Adrian's mentioned some of those, discovering correlations, unknowns, understanding networks. That's a big piece of where you guys are. Um, and drive collection. You may be collecting stuff, there's bits missing. You might work out what we actually do need. Here's some nice technical words. You've seen those in the blue on the right-hand side. On the, on the left, there's probably some new ones for you. Um, WAMI, WAMI is where it, wide area surveillance with sort of cameras that just take pictures all the time. Moving target indicators, they're probably the only new words in there that you don't know. This is the sort of the fundamental um, bits of ABI and this is a geos geo geospatial sort of person. Yeah, we've been doing this for years. And, you know, pushing the point home to you, you've got a geo reference to discover. I would challenge you to give me any bit of information that doesn't belong somewhere. I will buy you a beer afterwards if you can give me something because I need an example. Um, so basically everything belongs somewhere in, 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 or in some context and we need to get it geo-referenced. And then these clever words on neutrality, get everything in, sequence, and the old stuff may have the answer already. We don't know. This bit's a missing, missing we need to get it, get it in. And then we start integrating and exploiting. That is, that is the sort of the main concept of this. <coughs> Don't get too hung up on it because the right hand side, at some point, we've got to be getting stuff out. We can't wait forever to get this thing done. It's just a, a concept and some guidelines. But ABI in the intelligence word is, is the new thing. Though I'm telling you, as far as we're concerned, it's not a new thing. This is perhaps another um, orthogonal view of trying to understand and look at that, look at this. So, your data, mark logic data at the bottom, however, this is coming in. But we're then comparing it, contrasting, correlating with all the other stuff. And that's the social data, landscape data. Adrian's mentioned <coughs> this already. What we additionally can do, we can add insight by connecting to other data as well. It's not geospatial, but it's temporal. It's giving us some sort of age pyramid, whatever that, whatever that said. So hopefully you're starting to get a, get a feel for really what we're doing here and why we're work, working together with Mark Logic. This is the same slide that you've seen already with all the data at the bottom, at the top applications, configurable applications, typically web applications don't have to be. I'll show you some of them. But this thing that we're getting together, we've got all this stuff. Where does it go? How do we find it? The portal. So somewhere on our network or on the web or whatever, wherever we are, we have a portal where this stuff is put and we can get to it. And I'm just about to show you one of those just to give, give you a feel for it. All this complex stuff, how do we actually go to get there? So I'll stop the slides now and I will move on to the real stuff. So we're actually on the web now and we're looking at a portal. Um, this is a portal um, that was put together late last year for the Royal Navy for an exercise, as you can see, called Unmanned Warrior. Unmanned Warrior, um, you can't read the words at the back. 
but it's the biggest UAV, not just UAV, flying things, surface things, things that are sailing around, and subsurface stuff. So it's a, you know, a full battle space dimensional um, exercise, about 50 or so different types. <coughs> and the, the problem and the issue for the Royal Navy is they've got all these things flying and swimming and diving around, bringing information back to discrete um, ground stations, stovepipes. How the hell do we get it all together, get it in, understand it, correlate, analyze it, and push it back out for that sort of dissemination piece? How do we go about doing that? The platform that I've just done, Adrian's just, is clearly the answer. In this case, it was all cloud-based. The servers were all running um, in the cloud. The main data centers were running on Amazon, in Amazon servers without software on top. So we provided an open platform that allowed them to, to actually do this. Security, yeah, there's only a certain level we can go up to, but we're okay there. We know that in the future, for any guys with these sort of classification issues, you know, this secure cloud coming and in here already. But um, this, is, this, is, this is the actual um, platform we used, and this is the go-to place to find stuff, use stuff, exploit stuff. <coughs> and I'll, and I'll, take, I'll take you through it now. So if I just scroll through, there's sort of a... It's not a dashboard, it's sort of a featured content. So there's some stuff there I can go, go away and look at, and I'll, and I'll do that in a minute. Um, I'm clicking, clicking the tab at the top, and it's called Groups. And underneath the, sort of the front page thing, we've got stuff organised into groups. And what is a group? A group is a lo load of people working on something. And this is clearly military based, but it's thematically, maybe operationally based, maybe data, but it doesn't really matter. It's just a group of people working on something. At the back, you can't see, but these words are airspace management, anti submarine warfare, maybe communications, there may be analytic lace, it doesn't really matter. But the one I'm going to is airspace. So there's a group called airspace. Any involved in, anybody involved in managing airspace is in there, and all their stuff is, is there. As I'm pointing at the top, that green thing is an Excel spreadsheet. Just remember there's an Excel spreadsheet in there, um, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But I'm going to click on this thing. This thing is the airspace master plan. So following Adrian's planning analysis. This is a planning piece. So what we get is a little web app. And um, what it is showing is the pink bits is the airspace that these drones are flying around in. So we've got a view of where these things are flying around. Now, old school, before they used this, what they used was a spreadsheet. That spreadsheet I showed you. In each line on the spreadsheet was one of those boxes. And the attributes were XYZ, 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 XYZ. Next one was the name of it, when it was open, when it was closed, and the things that were flying around in, it, in any, any of the other safety measures. Everybody will get that spreadsheet. They will get a map or a chart out and draw that on it. That's what they, what they would do. What happened here, I won't click it, but the spreadsheet's underneath there. Um, they plotted out all that data and drew it like that. And without sort of going around too much, because it's temporarily based and it is a 4D database, I won't play this thing through, but you'll get the idea. So between those dates there, they're open, they're closed, they're open, they're closed, which allows everybody to understand, as this exercise plays through, what airspace is opening and closing. We can do it in 3D, I won't show you that, so we can see how this airspace is being used. So everybody can understand what the hell is going on. It's cloud and web-based, everybody can get to it. The guy who owns it, when he changes it, everybody sees it straight away. Old school new spreadsheet. Everybody gets sent the spreadsheet and they start drawing it again. And half the guys can't be bothered to pull things out of date. I think you get the idea. Um, a real sort of killer for this particular one was the airspace managers have to go and brief the CAA before this starts and say, this is the airspace we want. Typically what happens is they show them that and they uh, you can't have all that airspace. But they play it through oh, you only need it on those days and those hours, and it's open at nine. And the, the whole sort of approvals process worked really quickly and everybody could understand, never mind that everybody who's flying these things can understand what's going on. 
This was built not by Esri, it was configured by the airspace planner. We showed him how to do it, he put his data in, he did it himself. So that was, that was a, a planning app. A bit on the integration, so I can, I can um, click one of these layers, and there's a load of other stuff in here, weather and some airspace measures and controls. They'll, they'll start drawing as I do it. But the whole point is, very simple application, and we're integrating stuff together, and it's giving everybody insight. Really straightforward, really simple. So there's your first steps through. And then operational awareness, and I'll just click this and give it a couple of seconds to come up. Configurable JavaScript application. And this was, there we go, so those boxes you're seeing, the red boxes, is the plan that the planners have done. So the plan's been made and it's in, and at this particular time, the right time, it draws the right thing. So those red boxes are the ones you saw before. These blue lines are the ins and outs of the drones. If they get lost, they're going to fly it out of here. So there's some sort of geometries in there that we've seen already. An important point to note is GIS is just the maps. The map's not even there. The map's not important to us. Yeah, it's a bit of sort of a understanding. Yes, we are invading Scotland, but the map's not very important in this case. I mean, it may be that we need it, and we'll just turn one of them. No, there's the Admiralty charts, uh, Oak Street map, whatever you want to see. But for these guys, on this operations dashboard, it's just not important. We turn it off. We don't need to see it. It's the relationships. On top of that, and um, there's lots of different data sets here. I'll just turn a few off and simplify it for you. So, I'll come back to those other data sets. So, the sort of the, the little sort of triangles, the blue and the greens and the reds, that's AIS. It's an automatic tracking system for ships. Every ship in the whole world over a certain size, I think it's 500 tonnes, has to have one of these transponders, and it goes, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And you're seeing that. So the, the actual transmissions are picked up by satellite. Satellite flies over, puts the things down. You can't read the words, but we, we refresh it every couple of minutes. It's probably getting refreshed every 20 minutes as the satellite flies over. Uh, you can't, well, you can see some of it. We've got the live air in here as well. So from fly to where, all the aircraft in the world are available to the system. What we're doing is we're not displaying the whole lot, so we don't need the whole world, so there's a spatial filter. Just give me all the aircraft within 100 miles of my danger area. So it's only displaying the ones within 100 miles. The numbers on the left are pain points. Um, this is when we switched it off at night. Typically, those numbers are in the 20s and 30s. But the, the blue number is aircraft within 100, 100 miles, um, but they're high and we're not interested. The three is a pain point. They're within 100 miles and they're low and they could go into the area. So it's an ops dashboard. It's giving us some sort of idea of what's going on, uh, but it's giving us some pain points. That first slide that I showed, the mark logic, you could see some counters, some indicators. Typically, these op, that ops dashboard have those pain points. We're running out of fuel, the battery's low, there's too many of them in the area. Hotspot appearing over here of sort of terrorist incidents or crime incidents. But it's just an ops dashboard. And it's JavaScript and it's configurable. And that's Ops Dashboard 1. We probably have five of these with logistics and other things on them. Just reconfigure them and as many as we need. Because we're not all using the same thing. The Ops guys want that. The logistics guys want that. The guys on some intelligence system want some other insight. So that's an operations dashboard. Let's go look at something else. So, Adrian mentioned a story map. I'm just about to show you one when the network gets there. A story map is this sort of public engagement piece. So it's a way of disseminating information or explaining what you're doing or showing some intelligence products. This is the, the sort of the subsurface surface piece. It's an exercise called MASMO, bolt, bolt onto that. Basically what's going on is if I drag down, they've got a number of different platforms. There are things that look like torpedoes, they call them gliders, but they're submarines really. On the bottom left hand, looks like a surfboard, but it's got cameras and sensors, captures AIS as well, it's got things dangling underneath with sonars on. Um, 
but we're using the story map to explain to people what the hell was going on. You can't read the words, but the, the surfboards were sailing around there. And, sorry, the submarines were swimming around there and the surfboards were going around. And I can click through and say, have a look at that. Basically, as these things travel around, they're catching a load of numbers. Temperatures, salinity, sound speed, blah, 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 all that, sort, all that sort of stuff. I won't go into the whole detailed piece, but the geospatial back end can analyze it. Um, the left hand side, it's sound speed. So the sea is not consistent, it's moving. Sound doesn't travel through it evenly. Basically, where that slope changes, that's where submarines hide. And we get some understanding of the contours. We can do it in 3D so we can work out where submarines are hiding. We need to know that because we're trying to find them. If it's our own submarines, that's where we're going to go and hide our own submarines. More to it than that. But um, the point is, when the Navy look at this, it means something to them. And there are other surfaces, don't bother reading the words, but there are lots of surfaces on temperature, salinity, and sound speed, and acoustic waves. The point is, we can actually disseminate and publish this sort of thing. And then the, the actual gliders themselves, the surfboards, I'll just zoom in so you can see it. Uh, you, pr you may not see this at the back. These are little arrows pointing in directions. There is a sensor under there that works out which way the water is going full, fully through the depth. Um, this was quite interesting because the charts from some of the agencies had the water moving in certain directions. When we got this in, they realised the water was moving the other way. So the, the small-scale stuff from some of the agencies were completely wrong. The water was moving the other way. Qu quite a nice bit of insight, especially if you're in a, in a submarine or something, the water moving the opposite way. And um, this is a really interesting piece when it gets there. So I won't explain all this data, but this is the, those surfboards again. Not only were they capturing the data that I just explained the water moving around, but they were picking up acoustic contacts. The AIS that I mentioned before. So what, these are the red dots over here. So the satellite-based AIS was picking up stuff from a satellite and bringing it over. These surfboards could see it as well. So we get an instantaneous feedback of that's where it is and that's where we saw it. So we could do some nice little contrasts. The, and the surfboards were transmitting it back to a satellite over the equator and back down into Australia, straight back into the cloud. I don't know how... Roy, it took them half an hour to connect this up. Yeah. It was really trivial. The connections were really, really trivial. We also did the study to make sure the satellite could see. But um, there we go. Just starting to run out of time. <laughs> I want to just briefly show you um, a couple of other clients. So... Adrian mentioned um, Esri, big geo in supplier, biggest GIS company in the world. This is the desktop GIS. So for the really clever geo winters, there's a high-end tool. There's some clever stuff. There's some analytics of policy data and it's in 3D. Don't worry too much, but there's a really high-end tool to actually do all this and do some of the clever stuff. Um, having said that, some of the high-end analytic tools just clicking on the thing that said map. <coughs> Simple person coming in, I can go and add some data, search for layers. So you've seen some of this data, just searching through the portal here and um, adding some in. So any of the data that was in the portal, I just picked up some arbitrary piece I can go and get. Um, and if I wanted something else, search, I can search against something else. <coughs> And um, he said, these are economic zones. There we go, that will do. Not very pretty, but you get the idea. So there's some stuff that's been pushed out. You've seen the high-end client, but there's some of the simpler clients. I go and get some stuff, put it together. I won't do it, save it, and share it back out again. <coughs> And the analytic tools that I mentioned in the heavy weight desktop, I'm not going to do it here, but um, show you some analytic tools to calculate density. You know, how close are these things? Find hotspots, find changes, and so on. So some of the more powerful, simple to use, but more powerful analytic tools are available to normal people. So don't just think about clever stuff. 
Right, and one last one. So here's another client, Microsoft Office. So we've seen JavaScript, we've seen dashboard, we've seen some web tools. Microsoft Office is a client as well. So some of this data, have you seen this data before? So get the spreadsheet, drop the stuff in there. I won't actually um, run the analytics piece, but at the top, some analytic buttons. Emerging hotspots, those are the red ones and the yellow ones. Trivial sort of analytics in our case, but I think you get the idea. Right, we've just about got two minutes left, so I will stop there and wait for questions. Um, so that's our presentation. I, I guess the underlying message is if um, you use our stuff, you can probably still do an awful lot more with it. Um, if you use Mark Logic stuff but not us, you ought to get some because it's pretty cool. Um, and if you use our stuff and not Mark Logic, I, I, I don't know why you wouldn't ac want access to more data and more semantic data. Um, you can only enrich your analysis, and as you've seen, hopefully, you're limited by your imagination, not by the tool stack. Um, I, have we got time for questions? Or yeah, sure. Yeah. We've got if, a couple of minutes. If anyone does have a question. If there are any questions, or if not. Well, perfect. Thank you all for your, for your time. Just a short reminder again that we are looking for the feedback. So if you can log into the app and provide that to us, that's greatly appreciated. Thanks a lot.